Wall Street closes lower ahead of the release of the key CPI inflation data for April. U.S. President Joe Biden says the U.S. defaulting on its obligations is not an option, but a meeting with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy ends with no signs of progress over raising the debt ceiling. Stocks in the Asia-Pacific open largely lower. The SGX Nifty, however, signals a positive start for the Indian market. The government pushes back against capping rising FS. Civil aviation ministry officials are learned to have told the parliamentary committee that controlling fares at a time like this would hurt a sector already struggling with losses and high ATF prices. Meanwhile, go first troubles mount as lessers seek to deregister nine more planes, taking the total request to 45. Even spice jets lesser seek to repossess three aircraft, but the airline says all three planes belong to one lesser and will not affect operations. LNT may beat its FI23 growth guidance on the back of strong execution and order inflows when it announces results later today. Dr. Reddy's too is likely to report strong growth in sales for the fourth quarter, while its U.S. business is expected to come off as sales of key drug slows. Voting kicks off for 224 seats in the high-stakes Karnataka Assembly elections after a 40-day campaign ended on Monday. The ruling BJP will be look, uh, looking to defend the only southern state under its control from the Congress and the JDS. Hi guys, good morning and welcome to Power Breakfast. I'm Pavitra. Those are the top headlines that we have for you today. There's a lot that's happened as far as the global picture goes and lost your track in terms of domestic cues as well. So let's start off by looking at what's happening across the Asian markets. We're definitely not getting a good start. The handover from Wall Street was also weak. We'll talk about that. But for the Asian markets, you're seeing losses across the board. What's looking the weakest right now is the Hong Kong market. Seven tenths of a percent gone over there, so it's a 140 point dip. Taiwan is down around four tenths of a percent, and across the board, you're seeing similar losses. So you have Nikkei, which is down half a percent, Shanghai, which is down half a percent, Kospi also seeing a cut of around a quarter of a percent. So definitely a weak start across Asia. The only Asian market which is managing to see just a little bit of green is the Straits Time. Nothing big there as well, but just a minor green tick over there. The SGX Nifty will come up for you. It is indicating that, you know, we will get a positive start. Like you can see, it's climbed up in the past few minutes as well. 37 points higher on the SGX Nifty. Remember the last uh, hour or so yesterday of trade got rather shaky. So after that, it is suggesting that we will get a start in the positive territory. So let's see how the session really moves from there. That's what's happening across Asia. But speaking about the US markets, we had Wall Street, which ended Wednesday's trading session lower. So, that, uh, so the Dow was down around 57 points. The S&P 500 was lower around 20 points at the close, like you can see. And the Nasdaq Composite closed with a loss of 77 points. Now, the big cue really to track today in terms of the global markets is that the inflation data for the month of April will be released today. And we are expecting to see an uptake of 0.4%. This is versus the 0.1% gain, which we saw last month, that is in March. Uh, this is according to Reuters. Also, in some more cues that we're tracking, New York Fed President John Williams said that additional rate hikes would be possible if inflation doesn't cool down. So, somewhat of an indication that the Fed is not really done raising interest rates. So, that's everything that we're tracking from the U.S. But actually, something more that also came through is that bipartisan talks over the looming debt ceiling will continue on Friday. This after President Joe Biden hosted congressional leaders in the White House to discuss a potential way out. We were telling you about this meeting yesterday as well. And House Speaker Speaker Kevin McCarthy said that he didn't see any movement towards the ending uh, of the month-long impasse. So we have NBC's Alice Barr who gets us a quick roundup of all of the action from Washington. A high-stakes, high-risk showdown at the White House as political heavyweights square off over the debt ceiling. I didn't see any new movement. The top four congressional leaders emerging from an hour-long White House meeting with President Biden, failing to break a stalemate but promising to meet again on Friday. Despite a chasm between the two sides, the top Republican in the Senate definitive. The United States of America is not going to default. Democrats anxious to move forward. We explicitly asked Speaker McCarthy would he take default off the table. He refused. And instead of him giving us a plan to remove default, he gave us a plan to take default hostage. House Republicans already passed a bill that tackles the debt ceiling alongside massive spending cuts. If House Republicans get their way, it could also lead us to a recession. 
President Biden insists any budget negotiations must be separate because failing to raise the debt limit means that as early as June 1st, the nation would start running out of money to pay its bills, including things like Social Security and veterans benefits. The Treasury Secretary calling that historic default scenario. Really an economic catastrophe. It would send shockwaves through the stock market, American savings and even unemployment, adding to the tension, the consequences for both President Biden and House Speaker McCarthy. The president needs a strong economy to power his reelection bid, while the speaker is at risk of losing his gavel if he can't deliver on the spending cuts conservatives want. Neither side wants to show weakness, but both must avoid responsibility for economic calamity. In Washington, Alice Barr, NBC News. Speaker McCarthy offered a very different way forward. He's proposed deep cuts that I believe are going to hurt American families. <clears throat> Millions of Americans relying on Medicaid for their health care would be at risk of losing that. We continue to meet, and the leaders, uh, our staffs continue to meet, and the leaders meet again on Friday to continue our discussions to see what progress we made. So let me end where I began. This nation has never defaulted on its debt. It never will. All right, that's what we're tracking in terms of global opinion as well as all of the action. But let's now talk about the cues that you should watch as we get into this trading session. Our research team is here with the trade setup. Ekta, Mangalam and Surbi all join us now to take you through exactly that. Guys, a very good morning to all of you. Ekta, let me come to you first. Take us through everything we should watch today. We saw quite a turn of events in the second half of trade yesterday. But take us through everything we should track this morning. Thanks for that. Well, yes, absolutely. You know, this late sell-off that we saw yesterday really pushed the Sensex and the Nifty to give up all of the early gains that we had seen. So the Nifty closed below 18,300 in yesterday's trading session. You've already spoken about it, but it is the impasse over the debt ceiling, the US CPI data, which will be key cues to monitor and something that is probably giving the markets a bit of jitters. So the markets did give up gains yesterday, but FII's continue to be positive as they have been for multiple sessions now. So FII is net bought around 1,942 odd crores in yesterday's trading session. U.S. markets ended lower on the back of concerns with regards to the impasse, with regards to the debt ceiling, as well as the U.S. CPI data, which is due today. Asia is largely in the red at this point in time. The SGX, however, is indicating a positive start, possibly because of the kind of uh, underlying strength that we've seen for our markets irrespective of the global volatility. Brent crude $77 per barrel so there was a marginal move which took place on Brent crude. A lot of result reactions, Apollo Tires, Lupin, Castrol, EverReady, JM Financial, Nazara Technologies. A lot of results today as well. The big boys would be Dr. Reddy's and Larson and Tubro. Besides that the likes of Bosch, Godrej Consumer, Escorts Kubota. Uh, just keep your eye out in terms of what's taking place on the political front, considering that we do have the Karnataka Assembly elections today. The outcome will be known on the 13th of May. All right, that is everything that we're tracking from a market's point of view. Ekta, thanks a lot for that. Let's also talk about the individual names that you should watch in today's session. Like Ekta said, it's going to be a lot about the earnings. So we have Surbi with the entire list. Hi, Surbi. Thanks so much for that. So first up on my radar is Birla Corp. The numbers were better than expected. The revenue came in at 2462 odd crores. The EBITDA came in at 274 crores versus the poll of 254 crore, uh, 252 crores. Sorry. The margins came in at 11% and net profit came in at 85 crores. Nazara Tech, again a very strong set of numbers. The revenue was up 65%. EBITDA came in at 27 crores and margins came in at 9.4%. 200 basis points higher than same, uh, you know, same time last year. Hudson Agro, the revenue was up 10%, but the margins were muted because of dairy inflation. Margins came in at 8.8% .8 versus 9.8%. Castrol India, the revenue was up 5%. The EBITDA was down 7%. Margins came in at 23% versus 26% same time last year. Apollo Tires, the revenue was up 12%. EBITDA was up 59%. And margin came in at 16% versus 11%. And Five Star Business, a strong all-round performance. The disburse disbursements were up 72%. And the AUM was up 37% on a year-on-year -year basis. Okay, that is a long list of stocks and earnings. Surbi, thanks a lot for that. Let's also talk about all of the cues from the futures and options space. Mangalam, like you know, we've been mentioning the last hour really saw that big dip come through. But what should we track this morning?
Yes, the last hour yesterday saw a bit of a dip come through and that was perhaps on account of the Fin Nifty expiry because if you just take a look at the call writing and the levels from which the Nifty financial services turned, that would suddenly start to make sense. The other thing that is uh, supporting us and the theory that suggests that maybe the decline could largely be on account of the weekly options expiry was the fact that FIs and DIs are constantly buying in the cash market. For two days in a row, the institutional flows have been around 2350 odd crores. The previous trading session, the Nifty moved around 196 points. So that's telling you that, you know, a larger part of this action is FNO related. And in index futures, the FI sold about 500 odd crores and they added about 5,700 short contracts. What does this mean? 48% of their exposure is on the long side, 52% on the short side. But what has happened is that after the Nifty saw a bit of a decline from that 17,350 level, we have seen a lot of call writers extremely active. 18,350 has seen 50 lakh shares being added for a premium of 30, telling you that, you know, 18,350 to 18,420 odd could face some sort of congestion. However, put writers at 18,300 continue to hold their positions at 12.5 lakh shares. Open interest added yesterday with a premium of 71, telling you that 18,200 to 18,220 may be a bit of support. So what this basically mean is that the Nifty support has moved higher from 18,000 to 18,100. And now as we speak around 18,200, but the congestion remains between 18,350 to 18,400. Why is it that there is congestion? Because the Nifty Bank is facing a fair amount of supply at its record high levels which is about 2.2% away from its fresh record high. Yesterday, it at one point, went as close as 1.4% away from its record high. And today, it's the mid-caps which will be in focus because it's the mid-cap index weekly options expiring. All right, that is everything that we're going to track. Mangalam, thanks a lot for taking us through all of those cues. With that, it is time for a break on the show. Our first one here, but when we return, there are a whole host of updates that we have to bring you up to speed with in terms of what's going on with the aviation space. Stay tuned for that. Hey guys, welcome back. You're still tuned into Power Breakfast and let's now bring you some updates on what's going on with the aviation space. The government has pushed back against capping airfares even as prices surge in the wake of the go-first uh, airline being grounded. Sources tell CNBC TV18 that aviation ministry officials have informed the parliamentary panel that caps at a time like this would hurt a sector that is already struggling with losses and high ATF prices. Parikshit Luthra filed this report for us. This is a panel that is headed by YSR Congress MP uh, Vijay Sai Reddy. And uh, there were strong questions asked of all the aviation ministry officials who were there as to why the government can't step in and control the prices. Why can't a fair cap be imposed, a maximum lim limit be imposed by the government? To which uh, uh, the Secretary of Civil Aviation and top DGC officials said that all airlines are suffering losses, ATF prices are high, and ATF uh, constitutes a a big part of an uh, airline's operational cost and therefore it's unviable, it's very difficult at this juncture to go ahead and uh, introduce any sort of fair cap and the government is not considering one at this stage. We also asked uh, sources in the government if any kind of fair cap is being considered and they said uh, definitely not one at this stage. But let's see what happens. The, uh, the parliamentary committee has uh, had also asked them why a price cap cannot be done. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the, the government said that financials of airlines are very clear. They are all in losses to which the committee said that please tell us about the financials of all these uh, uh, airlines in the next meeting also tell us the rules and regulations around the price cap at the next meeting. We also believe that uh, MPs will ask questions on the impact of gophers grounding on airfare prices. So this is an issue that could be discussed in the next meeting as well. But for the moment, the government not looking at uh, capping fares at this stage. 
All right, so the government not looking at capping fares like Parikshit pointed out. So that is everything that we are tracking in terms of the fares. But there is a lot more that has come through from the aviation world. As we've been reporting earlier as well, the surge in aircraft is in, uh, in air fares is in large part due to what's going on with the GoFast crisis. Later today, the NCLT will also pass its order on GoFast plea seeking bankruptcy protection. This is six days after the tribunal reserved its order in the insolvency plea. Now, the cash-strapped airline is pressing for a moratorium, like we've been telling you to restrain multiple lessers from taking back aircraft. The aviation regulator on Tuesday received requests from more lessers as well, seeking repossession and deregistration of nine aircraft operated by the airline. And with this, the total number of requests seeking repossession of the aircraft stands at 45. In fact, speaking of the aviation space, there is fresh trouble brewing for SpiceJet as well because the DGCA has received requests from Lesser seeking the deed uh, registration of three aircraft on the back of unpaid dues. So a spokesperson for the airline has said that all three of these planes belong to one Lesser and two of these three planes are already grounded. And they have been for some time now as well. So the development will not really affect SpiceJet's operations. Note that earlier this week, the NCLT did issue a notice to SpiceJet on a petition by Irish lesser Air Castle seeking insolvency proceedings against the carrier. So that is all of uh, the updates that we've got from the world of aviation. We're going to keep bringing you more on this. But for now, let's move on and talk about the big earnings that are expected today. A lot is going to be about, uh, you know, all of the earnings that come through. And LNT is the big one that is going to report numbers today. We have Vivek here with the expectations. Larson and Tubro will be declaring its results and be important to track the kind of guidance as well as the order inflow as well as the core margins that the company had guided to at the end of Q3 and whether the company has managed to meet the guidance. In talking about the core numbers itself, revenues are seen high by close to 12, 12.5%, coming in close to the 59,300 crore mark. EBITDA seen higher by almost 11%, coming in closer to the 7,250 crore mark. Uh, EBITDA margins for this particular quarter, uh, the consolidated EBITDA margins are seen slightly north of 12%, and profitability is seen higher by almost 15%. Now, remember the company's guidance at the end of Q3 was that, you know, when you're talking about the order inflow, the company said that they should be able to beat the earlier guided 12 to 15 percent order inflow for FY23 as well as the execution guidance. So they were expecting to beat the order inflow as well as the execution guidance. However, talking about the core margin guidance, they went ahead and cut it from 9.5 percent to 8.9 percent for FY23. Now talking about the key highlights in the quarter gone by, softer commodity prices are expected to aid margins. In fact, Macquarie says they expect 47,500 crore of core orders, total order inflow, according to Macquarie, is seen north of 63,300 crore. Bofa Security is expecting FY23 sales growth of close to 18%, a strong beat to the company's guidance of 15%. Key factors to watch out for, FY24 guidance, last projects in the pipeline, as well as FY24 core margin guidance would be what the analysts on the street would be eagerly anticipating for. All right, we're going to wait by and see how the earnings really shape up from LNT. The other big one is, of course, from Dr. Reddy's. But with that, it is time for a break on the show. When we come back, we're going to shift focus to the world of commodities and bring you an update there. Welcome back. You're still tuned into Power Breakfast. And let's talk about the commodity space. As promised, we have Manisha joining us with a quick update. Manisha, good morning. What are you tracking today? Pavitra, morning. I'm looking at the crude oil prices because we have seen a bit of a slip on this one as there has been a buildup in U.S. crude inventories. But there are reports on how the U.S. could be looking to replenish the SPR, which is the lowest at 40 years now. And the market then, of course, are watching out for the U.S. inflation data. That is going to be the talking point today in the evening. A quick word on the coal prices, and this has slipped some more trading at a 16-month lows right now, below $170 a ton. The coal prices actually are half of what they were in the previous year. There is higher production from China and India and weaker demand outside China, and that seems to be weighing on to the prices. All right, Manisha, thanks a lot for bringing us that quick update. But with that, let's move on and now talk a little bit about the political space as well, because that is going to be in focus today. Polling gets underway in the southern state of Karnataka, and polling will be in a single phase across the state today to elect representatives for 224 assembly seats. And the three parties in contention are the Congress, the BJP, and the JDS. My colleague Ritu is joining us now from Bengaluru to tell us more about this. Ritu, uh, voting finally gets underway in this high-stakes battle after 40 days of intense campaigning. 
Absolutely, it is. The voting, like you said, is happening in a single phase in the state of Karnataka. It is now underway and will close at 6 p.m. today to elect 224 assembly representatives from the state. Uh, the three key parties in contention are BJP, Congress and the JDS. And it's been a high voltage campaign for over 40 days. You saw star campaigners from all of the three parties making their pitch. And this is a very important win or, uh, you know, state rather for all of these three parties because, uh, for instance, for BJP, Karnataka is its only bastion in the southern region of India and therefore it wants to maintain its hold here for the Congress also. This is an important setup ahead of the 2024 general elections. For the JDS also, it is high stakes. It does not want to remain just a kingmaker because remember, uh, it has partnered both with uh, joint hands rather with Congress and BJP in the past. This time we've seen them pit some of the local issues uh, during their campaigning uh, over the last 40 days. Uh, some of the key issues uh, that have dominated uh, at least as far as voters are concerned, the corruption, development of the state, law and order, farmers' welfare, education, unemployment, uh, you know, that we've been speaking to here as well. Uh, you know, Prime Minister Modi himself has been one of the largest campaigners from BJP, the face of BJP's campaign here in Karnataka. And, you know, in just the last 40 days, he's held about 20 uh, rallies here, road shows as well here in Bangalore as well. So we'll see how this turns out. Karnataka, remember, is the third largest state economy, the second largest in terms of GST collection. So it is an important state. Uh, in terms of voter profile, a quick word, there are about 5.2 voters in the state. More than lying lack of them are first-time voters. Last time, the turnout was over 72%. We'll see how this time plays around. All right, and we're going to keep coming back to you for updates on this through the day. Ritu, thanks a lot for that. But with that, we're going to wind down in this edition of Power Breakfast with the news that most Asian markets are in the red, led by the Hong Kong market. But the SGX Nifty is indicating a positive start, around 35 points higher over there. Thanks for tuning in. We have Bazaar up in two.